is my uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Philippe Troitlein. So we started projects, actually I started to participate in his projects, I think in 2012. And uh, Philippe is a leader of a quite big group in uh, Basel University in Switzerland. He's running experiments and I found his talks especially well suited to uh, to our audience because although this is experimental talk, uh, this will talk on the border between Bose-Einstein condensate probably or at least cold atoms uh, and quantum information and uh, technology about what you can do using quantum technologies maybe in future. Uh, and I think uh, on the other hand, Philip also is giving talks which are very pedagogical. So I hope that we'll learn a lot of new things and uh, this will be some excited introduction to, to new field. So Philip, the screen is yours. Okay, very good. So uh, let me try to um, share my screen now. Do you see my slides now? Yes. Yes. Okay, very good. Then let's see whether I can also get it. So this worked, yeah. And um, I think I can also get uh, some pointer here. I'm not sure. Normally I have an option here where I can choose the pointer. We see the arrow. So You see the arrow. Okay, then we use just this one. Perfect. All right. So uh, thank you very much um, for this opportunity to tell you about uh, some of our research. Uh, thanks, uh, Cizek, for the nice uh, introduction. And as, uh, as Cizek mentioned, we've been collaborating on various occasions over the last years uh, very successfully. Um, but we actually decided when, when we talked about what I would speak about today that I will not speak about our collaboration. So I would have many things to report about the joint work with uh, Cizek, but um, this will be re reported maybe on another occasion. But I will instead uh, speak about a, an experiment which we have done in a project in our group where we have recently um, observed a light mediated uh, strong coupling between a membrane oscillator and atomic spins. So this is about hybrid quantum systems and quantum interfaces, uh, one of the research lines in my group. So I will tell you about experiments where we are interested in such hybrid uh, mechanical and atomic systems, as you can see it illustrated here, um, because they offer new possibilities for quantum control and measurement of mechanical motion. And more generally, these systems allow us uh, to explore techniques for, very, for interfacing very different uh, quantum systems with light. And um, today I will mostly report about uh, some results from the paper that, that you see, can see down here, which, which appeared a couple of months ago, where we observe strong coupling between the vibrations of a nanomechanical membrane as illustrated here. So this is a mechanical device with a membrane, a very thin membrane in the middle that can mechanically vibrate out of plane here. And these me mechanical vibrations are strongly coupled to the spin of an atomic ensemble illustrated here in front. So all these spins behave like a collective spin and we observe strong coupling between this spin and uh, the vibrations of this membrane. And remarkably, this uh, coupling is not generated by somehow bringing these systems very close together, but it's mediated by a loop of laser light, as illustrated here, uh, over a distance of about a meter through a room temperature environment. So I find this um, experiment very exciting because it, is a, it, it shows that you can use laser light to strongly couple quantum systems um, over a large uh, distance. And this is of course interesting for building networks or hybrid quantum systems uh, in, in general. The experiments uh, are done in my group at the University of Basel in Switzerland by a wonderful team of people that you can see here. And I would highlight, uh, would like to highlight the contribution of uh, Thomas Kalk 
who obtained the results I will show you uh, during his PhD thesis, which was a quite remarkable and very successful thesis. We also have a very fruitful theory collaboration where many of the inspirations and, and the theory for uh, underlying this project uh, came from and with Clemens Hammerer in Hannover and uh, with Peter Zollersko in Innsbruck. All right, um, so this is about nanomechanical oscillators and atoms. So um, the control of nanomechanical oscillators actually has uh, made remarkable progress in recent years. Uh, novel techniques have, to, have been developed to use light for cooling, control, and measurement of mechanical motion. And um, these techniques allow one to prepare and investigate single vibrational modes of such uh, engineered mechanical structures that you can see here uh, with laser light in the quantum regime. On the one hand, this is motivated by um, the applications mechanical devices have as ultra-sensitive uh, force detectors, think of the atomic force microscope, or as versatile signal tra transducers that you can functionalize. And um, these applications are expected to benefit from controlling these mechanical oscillators uh, on the quantum level. On the other hand, uh, quantum control of mechanical motion is interesting from a fundamental point of view, as these mechanical systems allow one to study quantum physics or quantum mechanics really with massive objects that are in some sense uh, macroscopic that you can see with your bare eye and so on. In many ways, the techniques for laser control of mechanical motion developed in this field of optomechanics uh, resemble those that are already in use for quite some time in the field of ultra-cold atoms for laser cooling, trapping, and quantum manipulation of atoms. So for atoms, we can routinely cool their motion in a trap into the quantum ground state uh, using the powerful laser cooling techniques that were developed over the past decades. And um, this control and this manipulation and detection of atomic motion has led to many interesting optomechanics experiments with atoms. Uh, but atoms actually have new features that these mechanical devices don't intrinsically uh, necessarily have. Atoms have um, internal structure which can provide two-level systems or which can act as collective spins uh, with new properties. They, they can realize things like negative mass oscillators uh, that are difficult to realize with mechanical systems. Um, they can be prepared in non-classical states, such as spin squeeze states, using very powerful techniques. And um, these similarities between laser manipulation and control of mechanical devices and, and uh, ultra-cold atoms raises uh, the question whether it's also possible to use laser light to couple these systems to each other. So in other words, to realize a quantum interface uh, between them. And, and this is what we are investigating in our experiments. Such uh, um, quantum interfaces are interesting because one way to prepare and manipulate mechanical motion in the quantum regime is to couple the mechanical oscillator to a microscopic quantum system that can be controlled on the quantum level. So in some sense, the idea here is to make the atomic physics toolbox available for quantum control of mechanical devices uh, through this coupling. Moreover, um, new schemes for quantum sensing of vibrations uh, can be implemented in this way, where the atoms are used for back action evading measurements of mechanical motion or for remote sensing of mechanical vibrations using einstein podolsky rosen entanglements. So there are several proposals in this direction. More generally, um, I like these systems because uh, such hybrid systems allow one to study uh, remote interactions mediated by light. So we can ask, for example, whether light can act as some kind of mechanical spring that connects these systems to each other and that can realize strong coupling in a similar way as we can realize strong coupling if we bring, let's say, uh, two ions very close together in a trap or, or prepare some um, 
magnet magnetic uh, um, um, system very close to, to a spin and so on. So whether it's possible to realize strong coupling also over a large distance using laser light. And uh, we can ask whether this is possible despite this being um, a driven and open quantum system, whether it's still possible to realize Hamiltonian strong coupling and use this uh, for things like uh, state swaps and, and other uh, quantum tasks. So this field of hybrid mechanical atomic systems um, has been investigated in, in a couple of experiments over the years and I just want to give you a flavor of what uh, people have been doing without giving too much, too many details. And before we then focus really on our current experiment, which I will explain to you in much more detail. So early experiments in this field actually used magnetic coupling um, to couple a Bose-Einstein condensate um, to a cantilever oscillator using surface forces or magnetic coupling. And um, in these experiments, the atoms had to be positioned very close to the tip of the cantilever to get an appreciable uh, coupling. More recently, our group has realized such interfaces using light, uh, precisely for the reason that this allows you to couple the systems over distance. So in one of our experiments, we coupled the vibrations of a membrane oscillator, which is here inside an optical cavity, to, an, to the motion of an atomic ensemble outside this cavity using laser light. And uh, we could use this for cooling of the membrane by its coupling to the laser-cooled atoms. So these are laser-cooled atoms, extremely cold, and through the light, this membrane was coupled to the atoms and, and uh, energy was removed from the membrane through this coupling. And this you can see here, you can see the temperature of um, this membrane mode that we coupled to, the fundamental mode, as a function of time. And here we, we turn on the coupling um, light uh, and uh, place the atoms in this light and you can see that the temperature of the membrane drops by a, about a factor of a thousand um, if these atoms are placed here and coupled to the membrane via the light and, and this kind of cooling through the atoms in this hybrid system was actually stronger than uh, cavity optomechanical laser cooling that could be done by the light alone. So this shows you some, some of the experiments that were done coupling mechanical motion to um, the motion of atoms um, in a trap. However, as I advertised, atoms also have spin. And um, so more recently, uh, groups started to explore the coupling of so, such mechanical devices to the spin of atomic ensembles. And uh, one of the pioneering groups here is the group of Eugene Polzig. Um, here you can see a sketch of an experiment where they uh, coupled the collective spin of an atomic ensemble to a membrane here and subsequently detected the light exiting this uh, cascaded system here. So this is a one-way coupling. The laser first passes through the atoms, then through the membrane, and then is detected. And um, in, in this way, they uh, could demonstrate that by placing the atoms in the laser beam, you can actually make um, a measurement of the mechanical motion of the membrane that evades the quantum back action of the measurement this is illustrated in this plot here. So the suppression of the back action if the atoms are placed here. And more recently, they could also show entanglement between these two systems. So this is a one-way coupling scheme. So light goes through the atoms and then through the membrane and it's then detected. Um, in our group, we, dis we um, realize a different coupling scheme where light is sent back and forth in a loop through an atomic ensemble, then onto the membrane, and then back through the atomic ensemble. And you will hear later in the talk that this loop plays an important role in realizing a Hamiltonian coupling in, in this uh, two-way coupling in, in this system. And this we could uh, use to observe things like spin membrane normal mode splitting as illustrated here but also coherent energy exchange uh, squeezing dynamics dissipative dynamics with exceptional points and, and and other phenomena and so this experiment is what i want to explain to you now in more detail so this is the outline outline of the talk i will first introduce you um, to our system i will tell you about 
the mechanical oscillators we, we are using, these silicon nitride membranes. And then I will tell you about our atomic system and the spin light interface, which we employ here. Then there will be a, con a bit of a conceptual part where I will tell you how you can use light in a loop geometry uh, to generate Hamiltonian coupling between two quantum systems. So how to realize Hamiltonian coupling with light in, in a driven open system, if you want. And then I will show you a bunch of results which we obtained with the systems on normal mode splitting, coherent energy exchange between membrane and spin, thermal noise squeezing, and also dissipative coupling with exceptional points. So this is the mechanical device that we're using, silicon nitride membrane oscillators. Um, you can see a photograph here. So the membrane is the tiny, shiny thing here in the middle. It's an ultra thin silicon nitride film, which has a thickness of only 100 nanometers and which is freestanding here. It's attached to a silicon frame and it's under tensile stress. So it's really like a square drum. It's a square drum oscillator. It can vibrate out of plane. And here you can see a picture of vibrational modes of this um, square structure, fundamental modes, some higher modes, and so on. So for sure you can imagine this. Um, so what's actually surrounding this membrane? So surrounding this membrane is a phononic band gap shield. So this is a periodic pattern here which has a band gap, this periodic structure, right at the mechanical frequency of the membrane. And so this serves to shield the membrane vibrations uh, from the environment so that uh, radiation loss is suppressed and uh, also uh, vibrations of the frame don't couple to this membrane mode. And this isolates the membrane very well. And uh, so if we now uh, speak about the mechanical and uh, properties of this membrane, we find that um, they actually have very high quality mechanical modes. So here you can see a picture of measurements of quality factors um, of the mechanical modes of interest. So we, we are using this 2-2 mode in our experiments. And, and this has a mechanical frequency of about two megahertz and a quality factor of about two millions. So this means it rings two million times uh, before um, it decays to one over E. Uh, of the initial amplitude. So this is a very coherent uh, system and very high quality mechanical oscillator. And it has a frequency that lies in this band gap of the surrounding structure, which ensures its high quality. So these um, membranes has, have actually been investigated in, in the field of optomechanics for a while, both for their good mechanical properties, but also because they have good optical properties. Even though they are very thin, they can reflect light with a reflectivity of 60% or so. So if you place them inside an optical cavity, this has a dramatic effect on the light field and, and can actually generate quite strong coupling to the, to the light. So we place this membrane inside an optical cavity. So here you can see it schematically and here you can see the <laughs> of the cavity. So there are two mirrors, one very high reflectivity mirror and one lower reflectivity mirror, which is our in-coupling and out-coupling mirror through which the light enters and comes out. So this is a single-sided cavity. Light comes in and out through the same port. And we place the membrane in the intra-cavity standing wave inside this cavity. And now you can imagine as the membrane is moving back and forth, it moves in and out of this standing wave inside the cavity. And because it's a dielectric element, this will detune the frequency of this cavity and thereby induce a coupling to the light field. And this is described by this Hamiltonian here, which is the generic optomechanical Hamiltonian, describing a coupling between the membrane displacement X, M here, and um, the energy of the photons in, inside this cavity. So here you can see actually a picture of the experiment. You can see the two mirrors. And the membrane is then placed inside here. And this is a photograph showing the central part of the membrane with the laser beam arranged so that we can talk to the 2-2 mode um, of this membrane structure. So this Hamiltonian has been explored a lot in the field of optomechanics for many exciting experiments. And it describes the coupling of the membrane motion to the intracavity field. 
In our experiment, however, we want to build quantum interfaces. And for this, we are interested in the coupling of this membrane motion, not to the intra-cavity field, but actually to the field outside the cavity. We want to know how, does, how is the membrane motion imprinted on the light field exiting this cavity and how does the light field entering the cavity drive the membrane motion. And it turns out um, in, the, in the limit where the cavity line width is much larger than the mechanical mo motion, which is our limit, um, the, the light field can actually follow nearly instantaneously um, the displacement of the membrane and the light that exits the cavity uh, contains information about the membrane uh, position with very small delay. And so in this limit, you can describe the coupling of the membrane vibrations to the light outside the cavity by this Hamiltonian here, which describes a linear coupling between the membrane displacement and the amplitude quadrature of the light field. So we can you, you can understand this in the following way. If I send in a la an amplitude modulated laser into this cavity, then the amplitude modulation will actually modulate the radiation pressure force that is seen by the membrane inside this cavity. And this will exert a force on the membrane, which then uh, will excite its motion. On the other hand, if the membrane is vibrating, this will periodically shift the frequency of this cavity and thereby create a phase shift on the light that exits the cavity. We are considering that we drive this um, cavity actually on resonance with the light field. And so <clears throat> the first order effect of the membrane displacement is to shift the phase of the light that exits the cavity. So using the input output formalism, we can actually then write the output amplitude quadrature of the light being equal to the input uh, um, amplitude quadrature but the output phase quadrature contains the signal uh, proportional to the membrane displacement and the coupling strength appearing here is the so-called measurement rate of the membrane motion with the light. This measurement rate depends on this optomechanical coupling strength on the cavity line width and on the photon flux with which we drive um, this, uh, this cavity. So, what you have to remember from this is that there is now a phase modulation on the output light proportional to the membrane displacement. And this phase modulation, we will transduce into a signal that actually couples uh, to the atoms. So the other part of our experiment are, is the atomic ensemble. So the atomic ensemble is um, an ensemble of about 10 million rubidium-87 atoms in an optical dipole trap. You can see a picture of it. So it's a cigar shaped uh, trap, very long cigar cloud of atoms uh, at uh, 50 microkelvins temperature. And um, this cloud has a very high optical depth. So if we send a laser beam along the long axis of this cloud, it sees a very high optical depth and this induces then a strong coupling to, of, of the atoms to the light field. Um, we spin polarize this atomic ensemble using a optical pumping beam um, and applying a certain magnetic field transverse to the, um, uh, to the long axis of the cloud. And so we can actually um, polarize the spin of these atoms all in the same hyperfine state. And together they form a collective spin, which is the sum of the individual spins of all the atoms. And this collective spin of the entire ensemble can now process in this magnetic field. And by adjusting the frequency of the magnetic field, we can make sure that this LAMO precession frequency has the same frequency, two megahertz roughly, as the mechanical frequency of the membrane. And so we can actually tune this spin into resonance, the spin precession into resonance uh, with the mechanical motion. So in order to induce a coupling of this spin to the membrane, we also need to couple it to the light because the membrane couples to the light. And if we have two interfaces to the light, we can connect them to each other. This coupling to the light is also, is, is realized in this case by the Faraday interaction. So we shine in, um, we shine through the atomic ensemble an off-resonant laser beam, 
which is far detuned from any atomic transition and um, which realizes this uh, Faraday interaction that couples um, the polarization state of the light described by a Stokes vector here, S, um, to this collective spin F. And this uh, spin polarization coupling uh, couples actually the two Z components of, of the spin and the Stokes vector to each other. So what's the consequence of this coupling? If we send in linearly polarized light, in our case, we send in linearly polarized light polarized along the X direction here, then um, this linearly polarized light will be rotated. The polarization will be rotated in proportion to the Z component of the spin. So this is illustrated here. We can depict uh, the polarization state of the light by the Stokes vector on, on the sphere. The input state is linearly polarized along X, so the Stokes vector points up. And upon passing through the atomic ensemble, this vector is now rotated slightly uh, in proportion to whatever the value of the Z component of the spin is. So if the spin is processing, its Z component, which is along the propagation direction here, yeah, periodically changes during the precession, and this induces a rotation of this uh, polarization of the light. In other words, the Z component of the spin is mapped onto the Y component of this Stokes vector at the output. And so this polarization signal we can now use again uh, to couple to the membrane. This is again illustrated here. Here you can see the spin precession uh, on the sphere on which this collective spin lives, uh, transduced into a polarization rotation or polarization oscillation of the light described by the Stokes vector. In our experiment, both the spin and the light are very well polarized and all these uh, oscillations have a small amplitude. And then we can actually make the holstein klinakov transformation and describe uh, approximately these spins by harmonic oscillators. This is depicted here. So instead of talking about transverse spin components, we can act actually now represent them by a harmonic oscillator living in the tangential plane to the sphere. And we have a spin oscillator here and a light oscillator. And in terms of these um, effective spin and, and, and polarization oscillators, um, the coupling is described by a Hamiltonian, which is very similar to the membrane light coupling. It has the X quadrature of the spin, uh, which is the C component of the spin, and the P quadrature of the light, which corresponds to this Z uh, component of the Stokes vector. And so this is again a linear coupling between two quadratures uh, of these oscillators. And the coupling strength is again very similar to the membrane case. It's given by a measurement rate, in this case the spin measurement rate, which depends on the optical depth um, of this ensemble and uh, on the detuning and things like that. So again, what we have to remember is that there is now a mapping of the spin uh, quadrature onto the X quadrature of the output light after it has passed through the spin ensemble. Here you can see, for example, this uh, a measurement of the spin precession carried out here uh, with a polarimeter, which analyzes the polarization state of the light. And you can see this oscillation here, which shows a decaying spin precession after we have um, exactly. Okay, are there questions up to this point um, regarding our uh, two systems and the interface and so on? So, uh, hi, Philip, may I ask you? Yeah. Rafa was speaking. Hi. hi. So, uh, I just, uh, to make sure, so you, in your model, you have like both polarizations then enter your cavity or you just focus on a single polarization in the end? Okay, um, here around the spin, there is no cavity. So these are just, these are not cavity mirrors, these are just lenses. Yes, but later on, when you, when you will send it back to, to, to this your optomechanical system. Yeah, this I will explain to you, okay? Ah, okay. Just stay tuned. So I will tell you how we transduce the polarization into an amplitude modulation. Okay, uh, good. Just the cavity. Mm. Very good question. I have a very basic question. Yes. Okay. Because you have shown to us that you can cool down the um, uh, 
that you can cool down the membrane to very low temperature. But how do you measure the temperature of membrane? Uh -huh. So we can, um, this I did not show here, but it's a good question. Oops. Um, so if we, I don't have this, I'm not sure I have the slide ready, but um, if you look here, we use this interaction with the light field. And if we put this output light here, which contains a phase modulation, which is proportional to the membrane displacement, if we uh, put this on a balanced homodyne detector, for example, and then look at the spectrum of the modulation we see, then we see a modulation at uh, the membrane frequency. And we can then integrate the area under this. And this is proportional to the temperature. Yeah, we can, we, we can see the thermal motion of the membrane uh, as a signal on this light field. And the area under this uh, uh, spectrum, it's a Laurentian peak that we see. And the area under it is proportional to the temperature of the membrane. OK, so it's like temperature, but in the space of uh, different vibrational modes or, or no? Yeah, well, each vibration, the, the vibrational modes of this membrane, um, they, they have all very different frequencies. So you can see, so there are some at 2 megahertz, there's another one at 1 megahertz, and 1.7, and so on. And so in the spectrum, we can see each individual vibrational mode and see what is its mean square amplitude. And the mean square amplitude of this is, uh, by the equipartition theorem, essentially a proportional or the square of this is uh, proportional to the, the mean square amplitude is proportional to the temperature. Okay, yeah, thank you. So this is how we can do actually thermometry of each mode individually. All right. So now how do we realize the coupling between the two systems? Let me first explain it in, in general terms and then I show you the setup. Um, we use a technique um, to couple the two systems with light. And um, this is actually raises a couple of interesting conceptual questions. How do you generate like a spring, a mechanical spring that provides Hamiltonian coupling with light? Because light uh, yeah, it's a driven system, it's an open system, and so on. So initially, maybe somewhat naively, we, we, we could think that, um, OK, we, we need to connect the two systems, which I just call one and two here. Uh, with a beam of light. So let's first pass the light through system one and then through system two. And they can talk to each other. So for example, the system one can um, make a transition between two ground state levels, scattering a photons from, uh, from the laser. So this, this, uh, these levels could be, for example, two MF levels of the spin, so two magnetic sublevels. Spin can make a transition, get excited, and the photon is scattered, which now carries information about uh, the spin state. And this photon is a sideband photon on this laser, can now go to system two, can be reabsorbed here and um, change the state of system two. So by this exchange of photons, there can be a unidirectional coupling from system one to system two. But that's not the whole story, because instead of being reabsorbed here, it can also happen that the photon leaves um, the system without being absorbed and that actually the second system also scatters a photon like the first one did. So there will be photons, sideband photons leaking out from the system, carrying information about them and um, this will result in, in some decoherence. You can also use this to perform a measurement of the system but clearly this is not a closed system. It's an open system where information leaks to the environment and since this is information that is leaking to the environment, there must also be some kind of measurement uh, back action. Um, and in fact, this is generated by the quantum noise on the light that enters the system at the input. This will disturb uh, the systems and um, uh, thereby in induce uh, dissipative uh, dynamics. So this cascaded coupling of two quantum systems has been successfully used in, in many experiments where you perform a measurement here and then can prepare these two systems in interesting quantum states. But it does not uh, by itself uh, generate a Hamiltonian coupling, which is bidirectional and uh, usually is representing an isolated system. So now we can think, okay, um, let's actually send another beam backwards from two to one. So now there are channels for system one to talk to two and for system two to talk to system one. So this is a bidirectional coupling, but this problem of information leaking to the environment is not solved by this scheme. 
there will be strong decoherence uh, due to this information leakage. And you can now represent such a coupled system as on the one hand having a Hamiltonian coupling, but on the other hand also very strong uh, dissipative coupling um, to the environment. So what we do in our experiment to get rid of this uh, dissipative part of the interaction is we connect the systems in a loop. So instead of sending a separate laser backwards, we actually uh, send a laser from one to system two and then back to system one. So this is also a bidirectional coupling, but the light now performs a closed loop on system one and the same light field interacts twice with system one. And the dynamics induced in this case, you can imagine, now depend on the phase of these two interactions. Or in other words, in the phase, on the phase in this loop. If this uh, loop phase is zero, then it turns out that there is constructive interference of the light of the information about system one leaking uh, out from the system, while there's destructive interference of the Hamiltonian interactions between the two. So then you get dynamics where there is no Hamiltonian coupling, but only a strong uh, dissipative coupling uh, to the environment. However, if you engineer a phase shift in here so that uh, the phase in this loop is pi, then the light leaking from the system interferes destructively for system one. So the two signals induced on the light by the two interactions interfere uh, destructively. And system one is effectively decoupled from the environment while it maintains an interaction with system two. So this now corresponds to Hamiltonian coupling while system one is decoupled uh, from the environment. And we can take this one step further by making also a second loop on system two. And in this case, we can achieve a complete decoupling of these two systems from the environment while they still strongly interact uh, with each other by the photons in this loop. So now we've generated an isolated system, a set of two systems which are coupled to each other through the light. Um, we call this a decoupling of these systems by quantum noise interference because the quantum noise here on the light is, uh, it interferes destructively while it can still uh, uh, let the two systems interact, interact. And remarkably, the scheme to generate Hamiltonian coupling with light also works in the presence of optical losses because in each experiment, you will also have some losses here in between. And you can still get a very strong quantum cooperativity here, even in the presence of uh, optical loss. So eta would be the coupling efficiency. If the loss is about 10% um, or so, not too large, you can still get very strong coupling. So this scheme uh, provides us now with a modular architecture for uh, generating hybrid systems. Um, in our experiment, we don't do the double loop that I described, but just the single loop on the atomic system. Uh, but it turns out that this is already sufficient uh, to get strong coupling. So um, this is what it looks like in real life. There's an experimental setup here with uh, the membrane inside uh, uh, this vacuum chamber. It's a cryostat, but for the experiment, I'm going to talk about the membrane is not cryogenically cooled, so it's at room temperature. And here's the vacuum chamber hosting the atomic spin. And then there's a laser beam going from the spin uh, to, to the membrane and then back from the membrane to the spin, realizing this laser loop that generates the interaction. A bit more uh, um, abstract, this is what um, the loop looks like. And now I come back to the question that was asked before. Um, so first we send the laser beam through the atomic ensemble and the spin then maps its motion onto a polarization rotation of the light. And then we use polarization optics, so a half-wave plate in particular and a polarizing beam splitter to map or to transduce this polarization rotation into an amplitude modulation of the light going to the membrane cavity. And so in this way, the spin can talk to the membrane because it's the polarization rotation has been transduced into an amplitude modulation of the light that talks to the membrane um, via radiation pressure. The membrane, on the other hand, as it's vibrating, shifts the phase of the light that exits the cavity. 
And again, by polarization optics, this phase shift is transduced into a polarization rotation. And this polarization rotation now couples to the spin via the power delay interaction. So this is how we close the loop. We, we use this polarization optics to, in some sense, translate the language of the spin, which understands polarization, into the language of the membrane, which understands amplitude and phase. And then we have this phase shift here, which is this loop phase that I talked about that we can adjust to change the character of the interaction. And this is done uh, with some wave gates. And so if you analyze this coupling here, you can see that out of this coupling of the individual systems to the light field, you get actually an effective Hamiltonian coupling of the two systems between the X component of the uh, membrane and the X component of this uh, spin oscillator. And the coupling strength is given by the square root of the product of these two spin and membrane measurement rates. So this is how the coupling is generated. All right, and um, with this, we can now do a range of uh, interesting experiments. So let me show some of the physics that we observe in this coupled system. Um, in the first set of experiments, yes. Can I ask you one thing? Yes. So why, what is the purpose of half-wave plates? You want to set up some operating point that you like or? These half-wave plates, for example? Yes, yes, why yeah. do you need them uh, here? This you need because, um, you know, this polarization signal of the spin is, is, is in one specific polarization component, let's say the Y polarization component. And you need to make sure that this polarization component is actually uh, going through this beam splitter towards the membrane. And then with the, with the angle of this wave plate, you can also let a little bit of local oscillator mm -hmm. light uh, go through so that you have an amplitude modulation of this local oscillator. Okay, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in the first set of experiments, we, um, we uh, prepare the two systems to be resonant um, and we, we polarize the, um, the spin oscillator so that it um, points down in its lowest energy set state, thereby it realizes a positive frequency oscillator, uh, very similar to the membrane oscillator. And in this case, the resonant interaction between the two systems is actually the beam splitter interaction. We can then perform a spectroscopy of our systems. We have separate laser beams performing a detection of the membrane motion and of the spin. And if the, spin, if the two systems are not coupled by the light, we see a resonance corresponding to the membrane mode um, in amplitude and phase and similar for the spin. Now, as we turn on the coupling and we perform a spectroscopy of the membrane, we actually see that this mode splits into two normal modes. And um, the splitting of these two normal modes is the coupling strength between spin and membrane. And you can see that this coupling strength is larger than the line width of the individual modes, so they are clearly resolved, and, and this corresponds uh, to the strong coupling uh, condition. And in a similar way, we can also see the normal mode splitting on the spin if we detect the spin and couple it to the membrane. So this is the first uh, signal that establishes the strong coupling. In, instead of talking to individual systems, we are now talking to the coupled system and their normal modes. Instead of doing a spectroscopy and seeing this normal mode splitting in frequency space, we can also do pulsed experiments and then see energy swapping back and forth between these two systems. So for this, we prepare the systems as before, but then we excite the membrane motion with uh, a laser beam that we should briefly amplitude modulate. So the, laser, the, the membrane is now excited, but the spin is in its ground state. And then we turn on the coupling between the two. And if we do this, we see uh, the, membrane, uh, the membrane oscillation swapping back and forth into the spin system and back into the membrane system and back into the spin. What you see here is not the actual oscillations, but actually the demodulated signal. So this corresponds to the number of excitations in the, or the energy in each system. So initially, the excitation is in the membrane, then it flops to the spin, then to the membrane, then back to the spin, with some decay uh, corresponding um, to the decoherence in the systems. But we can clearly see oscillations uh, back and forth. 
And similarly, we can also do the reverse experiment. Instead of exciting the membrane, we can excite the spin initially, turn on the coupling, and then we see how the energy swaps from the spin to the membrane back to the spin uh, coherently. So these coherent coupled oscillations, um, they are the signal of the strong coupling. Now in the time domain, um, they correspond uh, to the Rabi oscillations that you would observe in, in cavity quantum electrodynamics, for example. We also see a, a slight sympathetic cooling. So when the two systems decohere and equilibrate, the occupation is a bit below the thermal bath of the membrane. This is because the spin is actually cold. It's, it's optically, it's, it's spin polarized and has a very low temperature. So they equilibrate at a lower temperature than the ambient temperature of the membrane. Okay. So this was strong coupling uh, in the time and in the frequency domain, but we can actually do more. So on the spin system, we also have the possibility to invert the spin. So instead of uh, spin down, we can start with an initial state where this collective spin points up in its highest energy state. In that case, we can also approximate it by an oscillator, but this oscillator now has a negative frequency because uh, as it starts to process, its energy is lowered rather than increased. And um, in this case, the coupling between the two systems that is resonant is of the parametric gain type. And if we do this, we can actually see a correlated excitations appearing in the two systems. This parametric gain, uh, Hamiltonian generates a two-mode squeezing, two squeezing, which in our case is actually seeded uh, by the thermal noise of the membrane. So what you can see here is the spin quadratures and the membrane quadratures, X and P, and their correlations. So initially the two systems are uncorrelated, but as we turn on the coupling, we see that correlations develop and the two uh, systems become strongly correlated. So the X quadrature of the spin and of the membrane are strongly correlated and uh, the, X, the P quadrature of the spin and the P quadrature of the membrane are strongly anti-correlated like you would expect uh, for einstein podolsky rosen type uh, quadratures. So we actually have a squeezed quadratures, which is the difference of the positions and the sum of the momenta and the orthogonal quadratures, uh, they are anti-squeezed, as you expect from this parametric gain hematoma. We can also look at the dynamics. Um, you actually expect that these Anti-squeeze quadratures show an exponential increase in their variance, while the squeeze quadratures show an exponential suppression. This is the squeezing dynamics. And when we observe this, we, we indeed uh, can observe these features and we get good agreement with our model if we also take the limitations of our system into account. Uh, on the one hand, we have to consider that the initial variances are given by the membrane thermal noise and then the Squeezing doesn't go all the way down as we would expect it in an ideal system because of finite detection noise on the spin oscillator. Our spin detection was not very good in this case. But if we take the spin detection noise flow into account, we can actually explain this uh, squeezing that we observe. <coughs> so this shows you some of the dynamics that we can generate. However, all of this was now done in the Hamiltonian regime. Where the coupling is Hamiltonian. But I told you that by changing this phase, we can actually switch back and forth from Hamiltonian to dissipative coupling regimes. This you can see here, this is actually the, the master equation describing the dynamics. There's an Hamiltonian part and a dissipative part, and both depend on the phase phi of this coupling. And so if we set the phase to be zero, then we actually get constructive interference on this dissipative part and destructive interference on the Hamiltonian part. And if we set the phase to pi, it's the other way around. And this is what we want to explore now. Um, so I will show you here um, in comparison, the spectra that we observe in the case of pi phase shift and zero phase shift. And uh, you can see these are again such normal mode uh, spectra. Um, this is uh, the frequency of the spin oscillator on the vertical axis here. And the frequency of the membrane is indicated by this blue arrow. And here on the horizontal axis, we show the frequency at which we analyze the motion. And 
you can nicely see a normal mode splitting here in the case of the Hamiltonian coupling, as I've shown you before. But in the case of the dissipative coupling, which you can also generate, the spectra change, uh, change quite uh, dramatically. So instead of a normal mode splitting, we now actually observe a level attraction in this dissipative regime and an exceptional point here where the two energy eigenvalues uh, or the, the two normal modes meet each other and become uh, indistinguishable. And away from this, we actually observe a splitting in, not in the real parts, but in the imaginary parts of, of the eigenvalues so that you actually have one mode which is unstable or is actually amplified and one mode which is strongly damped. And this, this leads to this uh, signal here with very large amplitude. And we can now play around with all of these control knobs that we have. We can do Hamiltonian coupling versus dissipative coupling, and we can prepare the positive mass or positive frequency and negative frequency spin oscillator and observe uh, the different spectra in these cases. And you see that there is a similarity of the spectra between negative mass oscillator and Hamiltonian coupling and positive mass oscillator and dissipative coupling, and similarly between Hamiltonian and positive mass and negative mass and dissipative coupling. This similarity spec is expected on the level of the mean values, uh, but actually the quantum noise properties in these cases are, are quite different. All right, this is what I wanted to show you. So some, some overview of, of the phenomenology that we can observe with these uh, coupled systems. Um, we were very excited when our experiment was working that we have all these tuning knobs and can realize very different dynamics. And there are still uh, many things uh, to be explored in the future. Because the nice thing about this coupled system is that we can completely change the dynamics by accessing the light in between the two systems. It's not like we have to build a new experiment each time for each dynamics. We actually change the polarization of the light, we adjust phase shifts and so on, and then we have a different dynamics. And, and this makes this uh, hybrid systems coupled by light actually quite powerful. And in the future, we expect on the one hand to um, improve the membranes further. So using some soft clamping techniques, they are called, um, we can isolate the mechanical modes even better. And we want to also cryogenically pre-cool the membrane so that it's predominantly driven by quantum noise and not by external noise. And um, this would then also allow us to do uh, quantum noise squeezing, not just thermal noise squeezing and study things like entanglement generated in, in this system. And quite generally, we are also interested in, in these dissipative dynamics that we see uh, but in the quantum regime. This has not been explored very much. And uh, to, we want to generate non-classical states of the system through coherent feedback uh, by the light. OK, with this, I'd like to conclude. Um, this is a picture of uh, my team. And I want to highlight, in particular, the contributions of Thomas Karl, that I mentioned already, um, but also um, Maris Ernser, uh, Manuel Bosch, um, Jameson Guy, and uh, Gianluca Schmid. They are working on this experiment. Baptiste Gouraud was also working on this experiment as a postdoc. He has now left us. And uh, I want to acknowledge the contributions of our theory collaborators. Thank you very much. You can, you can unmute, unmute your microphone. Now it's time for uh, questions. Um, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, so these thermal states, they corresponded more or less to a few thousand phonons. What was the, the thermal state actually? Um, so this experiment is a room temperature experiment. Um, let me see, maybe I have it uh, somewhere here. Um, I think here I have it. Um, this is a room temperature experiment. So the membrane initially is not in its ground state. Uh, it's in the thermal state. Um, you can see here uh, these excitations. This is about a million excitations in the membrane. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is actually not the thermal motion. This is a motion which we coherently induce by an external drive, which is, I forgot exactly, but maybe 10 times or something like this, or, or between 10 and 100 times the thermal motion, I guess. 
OK. But in Since the end, you are working at the borderline between quantum and classical. Are you planning some fundamental questions that you can ask here? At which point quantum properties become classical properties? Yeah, uh, thank you for this question. So that's, of course, an exciting uh, question. What we would like to do is we would like to uh, repeat um, these experiments, um, for example, um, with a cryogenically pre-cooled membrane where uh, the membrane starts out in its or near its quantum ground state. And, and then this strong coupling could, of course, be uh, used to, for example, swap some non classical state of the atoms into the membrane and maybe generate quantum states where the, where, where the membrane is in, in, in a superposition state of uh, two classically distinct states. I mean, such experiments would be very exciting. You bring the spin in a superposition and, and then swap that into the membrane. And then you could prepare quantum states of, uh, yeah, of this membrane system, which, which is in some sense macroscopic. You can see it with the bare eye. It uh, has a couple of hundred microns in size, uh, up to millimeter size membranes. And um, we would like to see uh, how long such uh, superposition states live and uh, whether we can see some new decoherence channels, for example. So your membrane will be become the Schrodinger's cat. That is actually one of the goals in this field, let's say, not just of our experiment, is to make some mechanical cat states in some sense, or kitten states, yeah, where the membrane is actually vibrating in two opposite directions uh, at once, or at least some mesoscopic kitten states where, where you have a superposition of two coherent states of the membrane, let's say. Yeah, that would be an exciting perspective. We are not quite there yet. I mean, I, I showed you this coupling scheme and the whole the dynamics that we can realize. Uh, but in so far, the membrane was at uh, room temperature. We need to further cool it uh, to bring it to the quantum machine. So, further questions? And maybe, maybe I would like to ask you, so why you did not in the end implement this three-arm loop? What was the challenge? Why we did not do the three-arm loop? Yes. Yeah, simply because it's uh, even more complex. Um, so this, oh, sorry, I want to go back uh, to see this. So you mean, um, why are we doing this? Yeah, yes. uh, single loop instead of this double loop where we have perfect uh, noise cancellation on both sides. Conceptually, this is uh, more powerful than, than the other one, uh, but experimentally, it means an additional beam path, which also needs to be interferometrically stable, and you have to inject the light a second time into the cavity of the membrane. This is possible. You can use, for example, the orthogonal polarization to go to this to talk to the same membrane mode uh, to the same optical mode of the cavity again, but but in orthogonal polarization. But it's again more control loops that you need and, and that need to be stabilized. So we did not do this yet. But there is no fundamental. There is no fundamental problem. No, this is just a conceptual, uh, just the complexity of the experiment growth. So we did this first, mm -hmm. and it turns out that. Um, in this case, you can also get uh, a strong coupling dynamics because the quantum noise is, uh, is canceled on system one if the cooperativity of system one is larger than of system two. Then this coupled system gives you a, a large quantum co cooperativity even though you still have dissipation on system two. So it's not also this partial noise cancellation is actually already helpful even in the quantum machine. other questions maybe i will ask last one because i remember uh, some projects i was involved in a strong coupling regime but in a in a cavity like in relative scheme and always there was important limitation due to um uh, spontaneous emission in atoms and here to manipulate atoms you are using the lambda scheme yes you are going for some upper yes. And there was no problem with spontaneous emission to other states which are not forming this two-level system. Oh, there is. <laughs> so, I mean, um, even though we use um, this far-detuned light here, I did not talk about this, but 
the limitation here on the atomic system is also that there is some spontaneous uh, photon scattering uh, which will redistribute atoms into other spin levels, mm -hmm. for example, and lead to decoherence. And by um, controlling the detuning, we can reduce this rate, but it is still there. So actually the, the atomic dissipation is partially due to this effect. And uh, you can actually show that, um, I didn't explain this in very much detail, but the spin measurement rate is proportional to this spontaneous uh, scattering rate, but there's a prefactor, which is the optical depth. And so if you have a large optical depth of the ensemble, then your desired measurement rate, the coherent dynamics can be larger than this uh, decoherence channel. That is why you need high optical depth. Um, mm. This is similar to quantum memories, where you require high optical depth intrinsically, otherwise you cannot get good efficiency. So it's a bit similar here. But yes, this is our enemy, the spontaneous photon scattering. Okay. Um, if there are no more questions, I think we should thank Philip again. So we can, can clap hands. <laughs> thank you very much for having me. and. Uh, of course, it would have been a pleasure to come to Warsaw again. Uh, I've been there before, uh, several times actually, <laughs> but I would have loved to come again. But uh, these days, everything is a bit strange and you end up talking in your com into your computer, which is not quite as exciting and inspiring as seeing you in front of me, but uh, <laughs> I hope you nevertheless could enjoy it. Thank you, Philip, for this. I, did, yeah. Yeah, I hope that we'll have the opportunity to meet in the next year. <laughs>